because uh, it's a country that has been at the forefront in fighting against apartheid. Uh, so it, it is a, a very reliable and important partner of the United Nations and I think it's well deserved that they will um, take over the presidency uh, next year. Okay, somewhere the UN Secretary General sustained a campaign that there is need for the developed world to come up with their financial commitment towards the fight uh, on climate change and global warming. How far were this during the 73rd session? Achieve this? I think that the financial gaps uh, to uh, deliver on the sustainable development goals are huge. The World Bank, depending on where the, the figure comes from, but we are thinking uh, uh, about between 5 trillion and 7 trillion the amount of money that we need to implement the sustainable development goals, to fight poverty, to provide uh, water and sanitation to everybody, to put in zero, uh, to go to the target of zero hunger, to feed everybody, to have gender equality, etc., etc., etc. We need between five and seven, uh, seven trillion. The gap is 50%. So we, we, we were able to gather 50% of the money and the resources we need. In climate change, it's also extremely dramatical because we put together what we call the Green Climate Fund. But the Green Climate Fund is still underfunded. Um, climate change is, uh, uh, requires the means of implementation. Proper funding, capacity building, low carbon technology transfer to the developing world. There is a lot of, of, of work to do. In September, Secretary General is organizing a summit. One of the issues would be precisely to scale up the ambition on reducing emissions, but and scale up the ambitions of money and uh, of partnerships that would fund uh, the huge gap. Uh, to, to go into uh, low carbon economies and low carbon societies. And it is a shared responsibility, but uh, the, the responsibility is greater from the developing world to the developing world. You're watching Diplomatic Ties. We'll take a break. When we return, more issues regarding the United Nations. Welcome to Diplomatic Ties. And we're doing our best to make it as convenient and easy as possible for prospective students. So what we can do is just um, support the efforts of West African countries to, to integrate, to organize uh, a better regional, political, and economic uh, integration. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Diplomatic Ties. Building friendship and enhancing oneness among nations. Watch. Diplomatic Ties and NTA International. Maria Espinosa, Foreign Affairs Minister, Ecuador, President of the 73rd Session of the United Nations General Assembly. How are you managing the two? I'm, I'm just a committed person, a person that uh, uh, strongly believes uh, in the, uh, the power of multilateralism, that uh, strongly believes that we need a United Nations that delivers for the people we serve, uh, a United Nations that is relevant to all, a United Nations that is closer to the people. And that's why um, I am uh, uh, traveling and working also in New York every day to make sure that uh, we, uh, we are uh, up to speed and, uh, and we deserve uh, and uh, we uh, gain, you know, the, the acknowledgement the respect and the, the buy-in of public opinion out there. So I thank you very much. That we're not talking about the media. Your last comments during the World Press Freedom Day, you said journalists will shine a spotlight on abuse, who tell stories that need to be told, who give voice to those who whom, whom nobody listens, who hold up a mirror to society. And if we don't like what we see, we should address the issues, not shut the messenger. What do you mean by this? Well, I mean that um, to be a journalist is not a crime. It is uh, a very important uh, part of society. And uh, I am not only P, but international instruments and international community were very much in favor of free press and security uh, for a journalist that uh, uh, you know, do their jobs. But I'm also in favor of responsible journalism uh, 
uh, with the capacity of telling the truth. Uh, and uh, truthful uh, news are also in need. And uh, we have to also take uh, you know, into account the risk of fake news, for example. So I think uh, we need to find harmony and balance there. But above all, I think that journalists um, should be able to do their work safely, safely, because they have a very important role in society. So let's, pro let's project into this 74th UN session of the United Nations General Assembly compared to the 73rd. What are your projections? Well, we have uh, done a lot uh, this year. Uh, we have received a lot of mandates from member states. Uh, we will finish uh, this session, hopefully, having met all the promises and, and, the, and the mandates. Uh, and I think what comes next is, uh, is uh, extremely, uh, it's going to be a, a, an extremely busy agenda as well. Starting in September with, uh, with five uh, summit level uh, events, uh, when New York will receive heads of state and government. So um, uh, issues of universal health coverage, of, uh, of uh, um, the first cut of sustainable development goals, the climate summit, financing for development, the Samoa pathway to assess progress in the development of small island developing states, and the next year we will prepare for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. So there is a lot to work uh, to do. Uh, the United Nations has to be up to speed um, and deliver. Uh, and deliver uh, in every day, I'm sure we can deliver with more quality, uh, with uh, more commitment and with greater capacity to touch and improve the lives of people, especially the ones in need. It was not sharing your time with you. It was a pleasure. Okay. That's it on the program. It was not having your time with us. Bye-bye. <laughs>
can follow us on all our social media platforms Facebook at NTA Network News, Instagram at NTA Network, Twitter at NTA News Now, YouTube at NTA News Online, or visit www.nta.ng. For live streaming, visit www.nta.ng. Now, you can stay updated on the news. Hello, this is NT International News, and I am Joseph Johnson. The headlines. President Muhammad Buhari expresses deep concerns over xenophobic attacks on Nigerians in South Africa, dispatches special envoy to that country. Federal government restate commitment to credible elections in Nigeria. Plus, hundreds of inhabitants displaced in Ekiti State as flood ravages 10 communities. Now, President Mohamed Bouhari has noted with deep concern reported attacks on Nigerian citizens and property in South Africa since August 29, 2019. In a statement signed by the Special Advisor to the President on Media and Publicity, Femi Adesino, President Buhari has dispatched a special envoy to convey to President Cyril Ramaphosa his concerns and also interact with his South African counterpart on the situation. The special envoy is expected to arrive in Pretoria latest Thursday, 5th of September 2019. And Vice President Yamil Shibaju has described as unacceptable the constant attacks on Nigerians by South Africans. The Vice President was reacting to the present attack uh, that has left a number of Nigerians and other nationals dead and their properties destroyed. He spoke to State House correspondent Gideon Nifade in Kano. Well, let, let, let me say first that um, this uh, recent attack is again a very is a condemnable act. It is very sad and very unfortunate that. Uh, the lives and livelihoods of Nigerians living in South Africa is once again uh, being destroyed with such wantonness and with such, uh, with such carelessness and recklessness. It's very, very sad indeed. And again, I think it's unfortunate. Nigeria has invested a great deal, not only in, in, uh, the, in, in the destruction of apartheid, in the pulling down of apartheid, but again, this is all contrary even to uh, the very ideas that all of the great leaders of South Africa fought for, including the current president. You know, this level of bigotry, this sort of bigotry is just terrible and is so completely unacceptable. I believe that um, Mr. President uh, has already uh, spoken about this. Uh, obviously, we're very concerned uh, about this. and. Um, we certainly intend to take this up with the authorities in, in, in South Africa and to ensure that this sort of thing does not repeat itself. It is absolutely unconscionable, it's terrible. Vice President Professor Yemo Shibajo there speaking to our correspondent in Kano. The federal government says it is pushing to ensure persons who looted shops belonging to Nigerians in South Africa are compensated and those responsible held accountable for their crimes. This was at a meeting between Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Geoffrey Yama, and the South Africa High Commissioner to Nigeria. Usman Aliu has details. The recent looting of shops and burning of property belonging to Nigerians in South Africa sent shockwaves among Nigerians. Many people wonder why such misunderstanding keeps recurring in the nations regarded as economic powers in Africa. At a meeting, leaders representing the two nations agree it is no longer a matter of silence. Nigeria's Foreign Affairs Minister Jeffrey Onyama and the South Africa Head of Mission in Nigeria, 
Bobby Morrow say they are worried by the criminal behavior exhibited by some South Africans against some Nigerians. Particularly Nigeria's minister Jeffrey Onyama said there must be accountability and responsibility whenever such crimes are committed. And um, essentially being uh, prepared to, um, uh, to preempt such attacks uh, as we're witnessing uh, today and uh, taking other measures including compensation and so forth. But essentially having the two working as a team. Apart from the measures the two countries put in place, they assured Nigerians that justice must be done. It is therefore quite very unfortunate that we find ourselves in a situation that we find ourselves in now. Um, the government has issued a statement yesterday condemning the acts of violence and acts of criminality. For us, these are acts that continue to demonstrate that there are criminals within society that seek to destabilize the country. There are criminals who seek to create an impression that South Africans do not subscribe to the principle of Ubuntu. It is expected that the measures will spur authorities in South Africa to address what people see as horrendous violence against Nigerians in that country once and for all. In Abuja, Usman Aliu, NT News. Meanwhile, the All Progressives Congress has strongly condemned the recent South African xenophobic attacks on foreign nationals, particularly on Nigerians, their property and businesses. In a statement by the party's National Publicity Secretary, Lanre Isao Nilu, the APC is deeply saddened by the unwarranted attacks. The party says attack on citizens of other countries points to a failure of leadership and calls on the South African ruling party, the African National Congress, to urgently step in as the ANC government can no longer pretend about this obvious contradiction. And President of the Senate, Ahmad Lawan, says he notes with serious concern the worsening xenophobic attacks on foreign nationals in South Africa, in which Nigerians have been major victims. A statement by Senator Ahmad Lawan observed that Nigeria has had enough of its citizens being targets of these attacks and will no longer tolerate hate crimes in any form against its citizens who are doing legitimate businesses in that country. In other news, Nigeria has promised to deepen existing collaboration and cooperation with Ukraine in critical economic sectors for enhanced benefit to both countries and their people. President Mohamed Buhari gave the assurance while exchanging views with the outgoing Ukrainian ambassador to Nigeria. State House correspondent Adam Osama reports that the president also granted a farewell audience to Sri Lanka uh, envoy, promising to take another look at the closure of the Nigerian embassy in the Asian country. The Ukrainian ambassador to Nigeria, Dr. Valeril Alexandruk, who spent over four years on tour of duty in Nigeria, was in the State House on a farewell visit. Ukraine currently collaborates with Nigeria in critical economic sectors, including education, military cooperation, and space exploration. The outgoing ambassador told President Buhari that there are almost 5,000 Nigerians presently studying in Ukraine, and the number increases every year. Education, he said, is a great investment for the future. Dr. Alexandruk said Ukraine also supplies Nigeria military hardware and ammunition to fight insurgency, while two agreements have been signed by the two countries on space exploration. President Buhari appreciated the highly beneficial relations between Nigeria and Ukraine, which he said will be taken to the next level. This is the sign of power of Ukrainian king. I so I present this for you uh, as a king of Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Meanwhile, the president has promised to re-examine the closure of the Nigerian embassy in Colombo in view of the important relationship Nigeria shares with Sri Lanka. Speaking at a farewell audience, granted the outgoing High Commissioner of Sri Lanka to Nigeria, Thambirija Ravin Thiran, the president explained that financial challenges which the country faced 
in 2017 informed the closure of some Nigerian embassies and consulates during a rationalization exercise. He said the federal government will take another look at that decision as it affects Sri Lanka following the request by the outgoing envoy. The High Commissioner who spent over four out of his 30-year career in diplomatic service in Nigeria described his stay in the country as remarkable in several ways. Mr. Ravin Thiran said Sri Lanka has a lot to offer Nigeria in the areas of counterterrorism, Medicare, and higher education. From the State House, Adamu Sambu, NTA News. Vice President Yemio Shibaju says Nigeria could achieve the desired economic growth when state governments give quality education to every child in their domains. He was speaking at the flag of, of Kanu State Government's free and compulsory education program initiated by Governor Abdullahi Umar Ganduje. Abdullahi Mustafa has details. This will be the last time these children be carrying utensils to bed. The presentation of sets of school uniform and other learning materials marks the beginning of a new life for them as they enjoy the free and compulsory basic and secondary education program of Kano State Government. This initiative, Vice President Yemi Oshimbaju stated, is in line with the Buhari Administration's Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, which encompasses free and quality education for all Nigerians. It While we continually seek improvements in higher education, and to enhance the competencies of our labor force. The starting point and the foundation for any progress in human capital development is basic education. It is in the precincts of basic education that we empower children with the fundamental cognitive tools to navigate and negotiate the world. This, the state is doing in education will have the support of the Federal Ministry of Education. The government has commenced the direct funding of such schools numbering 1,180, with a total student population of 834,366, with a total cost of about 200 million naira per month. Governor Abdullah Omar Ganduji assured that his administration will work with all stakeholders towards successful implementation of the program, which informs the two-day summit to generate inputs. As of foreign missions in Nigeria, representatives of development and donor agencies commend the initiative and pledge total support. In Kanu, Abdullah Mustafa, NTA News. Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed has restated the federal government's determination to pursue for the reversal of the United Kingdom court ruling against Nigeria and in favor of Process and Industrial Development Limited, P&ID. The minister stated this when he visited the corporate headquarters of leadership newspapers in Abuja. Anthony Forsen reports. The Information and Culture Minister is now versatile to the corporate headquarters of the leadership newspapers. And each time he comes visiting, it is always a moment to show an encomium on the organization. At today's visit, Lai Mohammed applauded the newspaper for, in his words, the patriotic position the paper has taken. It is in line with this that the Information and Culture Minister placed on the doorsteps of the nation's media not to be swayed by unpatriotic citizens who have formed a league with foreign collaborators to defraud the country. The company admits that it has invested $40 million into Nigeria and you give an award of $9.6 billion. This is unprecedented that the, the, the award is exorbitant, is excessive, manifestly unreasonable, it goes beyond protecting the commercial interests of the company. It's primitive in nature. I mean, and this, this is why we, we, we are quick to the sense of patriotism of our media in particular, to understand what the issues are. That it's not about one administration or the other. It's about Nigeria. If, if people can just come in, walk into Nigeria with a portfolio, and walk away with, you know, 20% of our, of our entire Reserve. You know, these are the issues at stake. 
Running the leadership newspaper's editorial team through the issues at stake between the federal government of Nigeria and PNID Limited, an Irish firm, the minister maintained that the federal government is doing all within its powers to stop off any seizure of its assets. Even the capacity of the contracting party, you can't give what you don't have. The Federal Minister of Federal Resources is not the competent contracting party. It has no gas. The gas belongs to the NPC and the ROCs. And that's why we are glad that the President has uh, asked the EFCC, the NIA, and the Social Police to really look into this matter and find out what really transpired. Who are those collaborators from within and without government? that led us to this, you know, uh, you know, sorry pass. We are doing everything possible and we are very optimistic that it would stave off any embarrassment. The forum gave the leadership newspaper team the opportunity to equally ask questions on other national issues which the minister provided answers to. In Abuja, Anthony Forson, NTA News. The coalition of civil society organization protesting the $9.6 billion judgment against Nigeria has threatened to occupy British and Irish embassies if officials fail to respond to their demands. On Nengi Fineface reports. <laughs> It's the second day running into the protest organized by the Coalition of Civil Society Organizations of Nigeria. They are clamoring for intervention to ensure that the judgment given against Nigeria of $9.6 billion awarded to PNID is set aside. But two days into the protest, they've not received any meaningful commitment from the British High Commission where they are currently holding their protest. <laughs> So, uh, today we've not been able to hear any response from them. We are still waiting for them to talk to us. But we've given them 21 days out of the meeting to revert that judgment. We've also appealed to Boris Johnson to step into that judgment so that they can reduce the slam, bring it down to the barest minimum. Yes, after 21 days ultimatum and nothing is done, we will come back here to occupy British Embassy. This time, no going home. We'll sleep here, we'll wine here, we'll dine here until a drastic action is taken. Some of the protesters are tired. They've been on the road for hours. Although they are tired, they are still resolved to continue on the protest until they get positive commitment from the Irish Embassy and the British High Commission here in Abuja. On Nengie, fine face. And Tienis. You're watching the news on NT International, reaching you live from Abuja. Stay tuned for more stories after these messages. Hey, you! And are you are to talk to? I sabi you now. It's in day your mind, Abi. The person with them go help us. <laughs> Baba Torosa, Shangalo, Oganekuva, Mr. Sabi. And you know if it carry last for this one. Hey, we sabi say picking will crawl before him waka. So don't look, no help anybody. No dolly no. So go for him. Go for football. Go for all Syria on the League of Marches live. Go for Go TV Max. Thanks for staying with us. The Federal Executive Council FEC meeting selected for Wednesday, September 4, 2019, has been postponed. This is due to the fact that all the memos earlier submitted to the Council for consideration have been returned to the various ministries. This action will allow ministers who were recently sworn in have their inputs in the memos sent by their predecessors in office. Similarly, the period is to enable the ministers who are still taking briefs from bureaucrats in the ministries and familiarizing themselves with their workspace have more time to contribute to discussions at the meeting. 
The secretary to the government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, says the current administration is unshaken in its resolve to ensure free, fair and credible elections. This was his message to a policy roundtable on elections in Nigeria, chaired by former INEC chairman, Professor Atahiru Jega. Timothy Yusuf reports. The 2019 general elections have come and gone. But many believe that it is pertinent to discuss and fashion out additional ways towards improving future elections and ultimately the 2023 general elections. The United States Institute of Peace is among the groups clamoring for improved electoral integrity, which it believes is a precursor for a strong democracy. Professor Tyru Jega was at the center of this process as the head umpire. Today, he is a member of USIP's working group proposing some positive reviews of the election processes. Since the 2011 general elections, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has striven to ensure greater integrity to the preparation and conduct of elections in Nigeria. With the theme, Post-2019 electoral reform towards improving the integrity of Nigerian elections, six thematic areas caught in across electoral legal framework, election finances and technology in elections were deliberated upon. Our elections must be visibly fair to be credible. The Electoral Act is the instrument that will be used to conduct you know, a free, fair and credible election, inshallah, 2023. Permanent Secretary. Cabinet Affairs, representing the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, noted that Nigerians are not oblivious of some of the attendant imperfections witnessed in the 2019 general elections, just like any other election anywhere else in the world. Notwithstanding any shortcoming associated with the elections, it was adjudged to be largely free, fair and credible. INEC, Nigeria's election management body, is expected to work with the recommendations of the roundtable in addition to its own strategies towards improving future elections. In Abuja, Timothy Yusuf, NT News. On another front, the Buhari administration will not tolerate the mismanagement of funds meant for local governments to develop the grassroots. Secretary to the government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, in a message to a two-day uh, Nigerian local government development summit in Abuja, urged state governors that are foot-dragging on the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit guidelines to implement them without delay. Mitari Igben reports. Over the years, poor funding of local governments have left most rural areas underdeveloped and neglected. The practice of joint state and local government accounts has equally not helped matters. To financially resuscitate the local governments, the Buhari administration, through the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, introduced guidelines restricting state governments from tampering with local government statutory allocations and imposing a daily 500,000 naira transactional limit on all 774 local governments. Participants here say implementation has been selective among states. The state governments are still hanging on to the funds of the local government. Because of the benefit they drive, they wouldn't want it to be scrapped. They want it to continue. The increased level of uh, uh, poverty uh, over the years is because of the abandonment of the local government system. The federal government, however, is tightening the news through regulatory frameworks to stop abuse of the joint state and local government account by state chief executives. We certainly cannot live with the continued mismanagement of public funds any longer. The present administration of President Muhammad Buhari has taken steps to upgrade the anti-graft money laundering regulations. I believe the government should take a keen interest in banks that are supporting this because we know and some states some accounts have been created and these monies have been other payments or salaries what is supposed to remain the amount is being paid in these accounts resolutions from this local government summit will be presented to the federal executive council by the secretary to the government of the federation in abuja mitaire ikben nta news 
Ten communities in three local government areas in Ekiti State have been hit by floods which have rendered them homeless. Director's search and rescue of Nema E. Komodo Akugbe Iamu led Nema delegation to the affected areas to ascertain the level of devastation for onward provision of succor to the affected victims. Eliasu Ali Yakube reports that the affected communities are in Adoekiti, Ikere, and Ishoru local government areas. <laughs> These are the rules linking Ikere and Obese communities and Adulaku and its neighboring community now completely caught off as a result of the flood, which has also hampered economic activities in the communities. Although no life was lost, however, the devastation on the residents and their household was harrowing. We don't even know where that water come from. All my people have already destabilized now. They didn't know, they didn't have anywhere to stay. No fooding, all their certificates have been already lost. The federal government should come to our urgent assistance. The state government said palliatives were immediately provided to caution the effects. Well, the directive of the government is that uh, first of all we have to stabilize the people that have been traumatized. So this morning, our uh, emergency management agency has swung into actions to provide consumables, foods, clothing, and mattresses. Uh, the needs of economy has been taken away from them by the natural, nat natural disaster. The only thing is for, for, for them to be rehabilitated. Leader of the NEMA delegation, A. Komodo Akube Iyamu, expressed shock over the level of devastation and directed the immediate deployment of relief items to alleviate the sufferings of the people. What you, what you see now is a very it's a very terrible situation. When we get to evacuation, you know, we are very grateful to the chief of the extra who has made available two C-130 and helicopters. The army has made available their specialized equipment, and navy has made available their boats. So, when it gets to the extreme and they need to be evacuated, the DRO use will be activated to evacuate them. Ekiti State is one of the 30 states predicted that will experience high risks of flooding by the Nigerian Hydrological Services Agency. From Ado Ekiti in Ekiti State, Iliasu Ali Yakubu, NTA News. Well, let's quickly bring you sports update with Ayodeji Makinde. National men's basketball team, D Tigers, have been admonished to go all out against South Korea in the final Group B match of the FIBA Men's World Cup in China. D Tigers missed out on the last 16 spots after consecutive losses to Russia and Argentina as a victory in Wednesday's match against the Koreans will boost their chances of automatic qualification for 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Nigeria's under-23 men's football team coach, Imama Amapakabo, optimism in his squad's ability to avoid defeat when they play Sudan in Afghan final round qualifying tournament first leg in Omdurman on Thursday. 22 squash players are presently intensifying preparations in Abuja in the night.